Welcome to the SDS conference in Houston. My name's Joel Dunning and we're here because we're delighted to be announcing the publication of the SDS expert consensus statement on resuscitation after cardiac surgery. I'm here with an outstanding panel that has helped us all to bring this uh, to you all, and I will introduce them. We have uh, Aaron Morton. Uh, he's a physician's assistant uh, from the University of Louisville uh, and vice president of CSU ALS, which brings training uh, of this uh, to the USA. Uh, I have uh, Jill Lay. You are a professor of nursing and clinical nurse specialist at UCSF. Uh, we have Rick Bell, uh, you're a senior clinical nurse at, uh, at uh, the University of Maryland uh, in Baltimore. And John Whitlock, uh, who is a nurse specialist for cardiac surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in the beautiful uh, Boston. Uh, so the guideline, the SDS expert consensus statement was uh, published at the Annals of Thoracic Surgery uh, yesterday and this now is going to guide the treatment of resuscitation after cardiac surgery for our patients. The reason this was created is for the absolute incontrovertible fact that if a patient arrests from tamponade where the blood has squashed their heart so much that it has stopped, uh, this stops CPR being effective. The other most important thing is that in hypovolemia or bleeding, uh, where the patient has bled out so much the heart is empty, uh, C CPR is ineffective. In these two very important c situations, a patient only has about five minutes for us to fix this situation because CPR is ineffective. Therefore, the only solution to this is effective emergency restenotomy. And it was this fact that brought us to this position because we believe that at the moment uh, people don't have the ability to get to that point. But it is a very difficult uh, thing to get to and we need to get organised as teams uh, to implement this. But there's actually a lot more to this guideline. Uh, there's a lot more advice and, and a lot of different categories. Jill Lay actually came to the UK uh, in 2009 because uh, you weren't happy with the arrests that were happening in your unit. What really stimulated you to come and learn about resuscitation after cardiac surgery? Um, like many things in, that we learn, it's through, uh, unfortunately, a bad experience. We had a situation where a patient arrested after cardiac surgery and our team followed uh, standard advanced cardiac life support guidelines, which included giving epinephrine to the patient. Uh, as soon as the epinephrine was administered, the patient was shocked out of EFib, and the epinephrine caused a significant rebound hypertension that necessitated reopening the patient for bleeding. So it was at that point that we realized that epinephrine was really uh, contraindicated in many of these situations and really could get you into a lot of trouble. So that's when I learned the protocol, uh, came over to the UK, and, and uh, was able to you know, bring it to our center and since then uh, share it with a lot of other places in the States. Yeah, a key principle of the protocol is to strip out all the extra time to speed our way towards restenotomy, but also to exclude all reversible factors so that you don't do unnecessary restenotomies. So Rick, we have uh, an important departure on the external cardiac massage. Uh, tell us about that. Well, um, with the algorithm and the history and everything else behind it, we've been able to delay and realize the importance of that where we look to bring in the, if it is indeed um, <clears throat> the need, whether it's VFib, VTAC, to actually shock the patient, then we will go ahead and move forward with that. But we can actually delay doing the CPR <clears throat> in order to not worry about causing more injury to the fresh sternotomy that was recently done. Um, otherwise, usually prolonging their unfortunate stay or yeah, causing absolutely. further yeah. problems. Yeah, we recommend we don't do external massage until we've uh, given three shocks and only then uh, we do massage. And, uh, and John, what do we recommend uh, for asystole? For asystole, we, re we recommend pacing. We, all of our patients have epicardial wires and there's really no reason for us to not just use them. Interestingly, in the protocols, we do not recommend atropine. Maybe you can explain that a little bit. <laughs> uh, it was one of the most controversial things, and they've gone out of all, all the guidelines uh, for general uh, cardiac surgery, but uh, we thought that atropine actually is less effective uh, than people might think, and because we've got great pacing, temporary pacing-wise or external pacing, that should be an effective treatment. Uh, so we wanted to come into line with international guidelines and withdraw the atropine. So yeah, exactly as you said, in 
no, Sicily, we're not going to do external massage. Uh, we're going to uh, go for the pacing and only then do CPR. Um, uh, Aaron, for, for PEA, there isn't any quick fix really for that, but we do have one sort of important thing that we've, uh, that we've discovered about PEA. Maybe tell us a little bit about the PEA protocol. For PEA and the consensus statement, we've discovered that it's more beneficial to correct all the H's and T's which are covered within the guideline with our airway position to help ensure that all the H and T's are covered to help avoid that line of arrest. Yeah, and, uh, and one little thing that we have uh, heard several case reports of is that uh, people have mistaken PEA uh, for the pacing spikes. So we do recommend that you turn off your pacemaker uh, and, and actually sometimes you can see underlying VF. Uh, so that is one thing we have heard several case reports of. Uh, so Jill, it's not all rushing straight to restenotomy. What other things that can, do we need to exclude? And I think we think of airway and breathing really. Um, definitely you want to make sure that you haven't missed any reversible causes such as a malpositioned endotracheal tube. You want to make sure that the patient doesn't have a tension pneumothorax, something that would be easily corrected. And so it really does focus on those initial uh, low-hanging fruit, if you will, the things that could be easily correctable. And um, the algorithm really takes you through very quick steps in order to make sure you've eliminated all of those potential problems and then uh, move very quickly into a resternotomy if there is no other options to support the patient. And maybe just tell us a little bit about uh, your experience of implementing the protocol in before and after, how you feel it's improved care at your institution. Well, we actually do have data to show that it's significantly improved our patient outcomes. Our survival rates have tripled since we started using this. And in fact, several years ago, we had uh, an 85% survival after cardiac arrest, significantly higher than anything that's been reported in the literature. And the reason for this is that not only have we, um, you know, approached this with uh, these guidelines or these uh, different approaches, but it really is organizing ourselves and training as a team so that when these events occur, we know exactly what to do. We're not waiting for orders. Our nurses organize themselves. They know exactly what roles to take. And we're just much, much more efficient when these events occur in our unit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Rick, you now teach this regularly. How do you, what do the candidates say to you about uh, once they've been taught? Well, they, we review all our evaluations uh, to really look at that feedback and the soundboard that is through pretty much every class and all majority of the people is this starts to make things make sense. It takes the chaos out of the otherwise crazy situation that's occurring and all the excitement that's going on and it provides some structure. So the roles as well as the algorithm and then people know that those roles are the key and you take out the extraneous people and it's like if I don't need those then you need to step back and that becomes the core group and they can execute that and you can do it in a timely fashion and we've actually seen that not just in class but happen for real like Jill has said and to implement this it's truly a joy to watch your students be able to actually perform this even when I'm nowhere around and it's <coughs> probably the happiest I've been. <laughs> <laughs> and, and John you've taught this for several years as well I mean who should uh, learn this I mean should it just be the doctors or should it just be who, who should who should learn this? That's a good point so at Beth Israel um, in our initial phase we actually focused on the nurses but quickly realized that we needed to include really everybody and so by the end of the first year we had achieved a hundred percent of the staff's training. An important bedrock of the whole protocol is group training and repeated practice sessions. Um, and we, didn't, we, we didn't have a large enough number to follow outcome data, but what we were very interested in at Beth Israel was people's confidence levels in dealing with cardiac surgery emergencies. Historically, everybody had an idea of what they were supposed to do and working as a team, but we've never practiced those rules together and talked through. So we were able to improve our confidence level of the staff, and this includes the physicians, the uh, uh, mid-levels, nurse practitioners, and uh, physician's assistant, and the registered nurses by about 60% after the first year, and pretty much keep that up. We've almost eliminated the chaos that happens with these things. I don't think that we'll ever be able to completely eradicate that, but there have definitely been situations where I've stood and felt very proud of the fact that 
a cardiac surgery open chest arrest is happening and actually the rest of the unit isn't even affected by that. The teams are working so smoothly. And uh, thank you very much. And, and Aaron, uh, you helped to run a uh, not-for-profit organization that actually uh, brings out training to America. Maybe you can tell us uh, how we're trying to help people across America implement this guideline. Realizing there is a vast number of individuals that should have this training to help uh, protect patients from arrest um, and the bad outcomes of such, we've developed multiple ways that folks can obtain this education. Um, through CSU ALS North America. We have a website, uh, www.csu-als.org. We have a list of all the training sites that are currently running this uh, education throughout the country. Uh, we can come to your unit and bring a host of trainers with us um, with a mannequin and work with your equipment, your staff, your educators to bring this in-house. Um, and it really serves as a real team building exercise because you get to practice with a new protocol uh, all together um, and it's foreign to everybody so everybody's on the same page. Um, additionally we have courses offered around the country through different organizations and different um, kind of one-off courses uh, that folks can attend and they're on our website to get more education. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for the very hard work uh, you've all done uh, in bringing this. Uh, I really do truly believe this will save lives. It's a really difficult thing to get a re done in five minutes with a team, uh, and it's really important that everybody works together. So thank you all of you for all your hard work, uh, and thank you for watching. And do please uh, take a look at the guidelines and, uh, and try and get it into practice in your hospital. Wait just a minute before we finish. I would like to thank you, Joel, for bringing this to the United States. The cardiac surgical community is really indebted to you, and we will be saving many more patient lives because of this approach. Thank you. Aren't you nice? <laughs> Very much so. Um, I learned of this from Jill, who learned from it from Joel, and I've only recently been with this, and I can say it has made a complete difference in my own unit. <clears throat> and I'm uh, not only very proud, but uh, very appreciative as well. So thank you again. Thank you.